Well, I bet you didn't expect to see this pretty face again. In this video, we're going to go over how to paint a skin texture using only Blender. Instead of creating a shader that can be used in EV or Cycles, we're going to be using the Texture Painting workspace to create a texture map that we can then export into other environments such as a game engine. Now, I've already gone through the process of retopologizing my high poly character head, and I'll leave a link to the Flipped Normals video which will help you get started with retopology in Blender. But this is the model that we're going to be painting our skin texture on after we bake down the high poly details into our normal map. So if I click on our low topology head and I tab into edit mode, you can see that I've already cut a number of seams and this head has already been UV unwrapped. So if I drag off another panel here and I go to our UV editor, you can see our UV layout. Now I'm going to create a new image, which we'll use to bake down our normal map. So I'll create new image. I'm going to create a 2K texture, so 2048 by 2048, and I'm going to call it head normal bake. Now I'm going to drag up a new panel and I'm going to go to our shader editor. I'm going to give our low topology head a new material. And I'm going to create an image texture. I'm going to set this to our head normal bake. I'm going to plug that into a normal map node, which will be set to tangent space. And I'm going to plug that into the normal slot on our shader. Also, for our image texture, I'm going to switch it to non-color data. Now I'm going to go to my render properties, and I'm going to switch from EV to cycles because the baking options are only available in cycles. So I'm going to go down to my baking options, and I'm going to switch from combined to normal, so that we're only baking a normal map. Next, I'm going to hit the checkbox next to selected to active. On the output, I'm going to put the margin pixels at 2. Now, if we hit the arrow next to selected to active, it brings up some more useful options. For one, the max ray distance is the distance from the surface of our model that Blender will shoot out a ray and scan for high poly detail to bake down into our mesh, while the extrusion value helps to inflate the active object so that Blender can better scan for high poly detail, similar to how you would use a cage. Now this method is also very similar to how you do your baking in other programs such as Marmoset Toolbag or Substance Painter. And I'm often finding that you'll get better results using the extrusion value than you would if you were using an actual cage object. So I'm going to set my max ray distance to something of 0.01 meters, and I'm going to set my extrusion to something of 0.02. Now if I click on my image texture, and I'm going to unhide my high poly collection, and I'll hit control and select our high poly head. Now, it's important that the low poly object is still the active object, as that's the object that we're baking down to. Now, with everything set up, we should be able to bake out our normal map. And now, if we look at the results, we can see it actually came out pretty good. Now, there's a few small issues. For one, there's a lot of clipping going on around the neck area. And we can fix a lot of that simply by increasing our extrusion value. So I'm going to go up from 0 0.02 meters to 0 0.05. Now we can just go ahead and click Bake again. And now you can see pretty much all the clipping areas are gone, and we have a pretty good normal map. Now, if you're still having problems capturing your high poly detail and increasing the extrusion value isn't working for you, then you might need to create more geometry or more edge loops on your low poly model to fully encompass your high poly topology. As I briefly mentioned before, there are also a number of other programs that you can use to create your normal bakes, such as Marmoset Toolbag, Substance Painter, ZBrush, and even other free applications such as X Normals, which has been used in the game industry for a very long time. So now that we have our normal bake, I'm going to go to our UV editor 
I'm going to hit N on the keyboard, and I'm just going to make sure it saves the results of our normal bake. Now, if we go back to our baking options, you can see that you can bake out a variety of other texture maps, including an ambient occlusion and your diffuse color. Now, these can be highly useful in the texturing process, but I'm going to go over some alternative means of creating these texture maps. Now, one application that I want to mention real quick is Materialize by Bounding Box Software, which is one of the fastest free options for generating your ambient occlusion and curvature texture maps. To give a brief overview, all I would have to do is come over to the O under my normal map and import the normal map we exported from Blender. Then with my normal map imported, all I would have to do is go to create under edge map or ambient occlusion and simply adjust the parameters to my liking. Then hit set as to save the map. Now, if I wanted to also create a metallic or smoothness slash roughness map, I would have to import some sort of diffuse color texture, which we could do after we're finished with the skin painting texture. Once we had all our texture maps created and materialized, you could pack them however you like, such as creating an arms or an ambient roughness and metallic map where all the separate textures are set to individual RGB channels and then use that in a game engine such as Unreal. Now, going back to Blender, I'm gonna show you a quick and sloppy way that you can create your other texture maps and export them as well. Now, I'll leave linked below a video by the Quixel Studio team, which explains some other methods that you can use to create an ambient occlusion, curvature map, and an ID map. But we're going to use a slightly different method, just using the shader editor. So we won't even have to use the baking options for the rest of this video. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to switch back to Eevee. I'm also going to hit the checkbox next to ambient occlusion. Now I'm just going to hide everything from the high poly collection and I'm going to switch to the material viewport. So now with the checkbox marked next to ambient occlusion, I'm going to go ahead and add an ambient occlusion node. And I'm going to plug our normal map into the normal input on the ambient occlusion node and I'll take the ambient occlusion output and plug that into our base color. Now, so that we can better see just how much ambient occlusion is being added to our model, I'm going to create a new plane object. And I'm gonna drag that back on the Y axis. I'm then gonna give this plane object the same material as our character head. And now if we zoom in, we can see the effect that the ambient occlusion node is having on our shader. Now, if we only want to preview what this ambient occlusion node is doing, then we can click on the node and then hit control shift and then click. And that'll bring up this little viewer option so that we're only viewing the effects that this node and everything before it is having. But to do this, make sure that you have the node wrangler add on turned on in your blender preferences. Now, if I want to control this ambient occlusion independent from the normal map node that we're using for our normal input, then I'll just duplicate this one, drag it off, replug in our image texture. So with this normal map plugged into our ambient occlusion, I can independently increase or decrease the strength without it affecting the rest of our normal detail. However, this ambient occlusion is simply relegated to our shader editor. We need to export it in order to use it in another program, such as a game engine. So I'm going to hit Shift S and select Cursor to Selected. Next, in Top View, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to insert a new camera. I'll drag this camera up on the Z axis and in the camera properties, I'm going to switch it from perspective to orthographic. Now in the output properties, I'm going to change the camera's resolution to 2048 
by 2048. And now the plane that we have our material being displayed on in Blender units is about two meters by two meters. So I'm gonna go back to our camera and in the camera properties, I'm gonna change the orthographic scale to two. And now with this setup, the camera will only capture the entirety of the plane because it's in orthographic, it won't capture any perspective distortion. And with our material, if we have our nodes plugged into the viewer, which is technically an emission shader, then there won't be any lighting impact, even if we had any sort of environmental lighting in our scene. So now if I render a shot from this camera, we get an image that we can export as our ambient occlusion map. Next, I'm going to Frankenstein a bit of a curvature map. Now, you may or may not even need to create this map, but I'll show you some ways you can use it later on. So to start, I'll just grab my selection of nodes and I'll give myself a little bit more room. Now, I'm going to create a separate RGB node, and I'm going to directly plug in our normal map image texture into the separate RGB. Now I'm going to create a mixed RGB and I'm going to set it to multiply. Also increase the factor to 100 and I'm going to plug in the red and the green value to multiply them together. Once again, if I hit control shift and click, we can preview what that looks like. Now I'm going to create a color ramps node and I'm going to plug in our blue value. If I go to this arrow, I'm going to flip the color ramp to invert the blue value. Now I'm going to create another mix RGB node. I'm going to set this one to screen. And I'll plug in the result of multiplying our red and green value with the inverted blue value. And once again, if I hit control shift and click, we can see what that looks like. And this is essentially giving us something that would be similar to a curvature map. I can also use the handles on the color ramp node to control the spread of some of the curvature effect. And just like with the ambient occlusion, we can render out our curvature map. So now that we have finally covered all the groundwork, it is time to start texturing this character's head. So I'm going to jump over to the texture painting workspace and we'll create a new image. We'll call this skin texture at 2048 by 2048. I'm also going to drag off a new panel and bring back our shader editor. And I'm going to go ahead and insert the new image texture that we just made. I'll also create a mix RGB set to multiply with our ambient occlusion value being added on top of our skin texture. Okay, so after I make a few more adjustments and I clean up my shader graph a little bit, I'm going to use the paint bucket tool, which is the fill tool, to just drop in one flat base color over our entire character head. Now this flat base color might depend on the race and ethnicity of your character, but it should usually be something at a low to mid saturation and at a mid to high brightness. Just like with the sculpting workspace, We'll turn on the symmetry option so that whatever we're painting is mirrored over to the x-axis or whichever direction that you choose. Next, I'll start brushing in some highly saturated colors, which we are going to steadily blend into our character's skin texture. Now, these highly saturated areas represent the color zones of the face. In doing this, I'm making a lot of use out of my tablet's pen pressure sensitivity. I'm only lightly brushing in these colors and I'll often set the strength to a lower value, like 0.5 or 0.8. It 
and then just lightly tap with my brush to mix in the colors. I also have the scroll wheel on my tablet set to adjust my brush size, but by default you can do this with the bracket keys on your keyboard. I'll also use the smudge tool to steadily blend areas together. I'm setting the smudge brush to a strength of 0.5 and then only lightly pressing with my tablet to steadily blend the three color zones together. When it comes to the color zones of the face, the forehead and top of the head will often have somewhat of a white yellowish hue because there simply isn't a lot more under the skin other than the skull. This is where the bone of the skull is probably pressed closest to the skin. As opposed to the cheeks, in which there are a lot of capillaries, veins, and blood vessels that are highly oxygenated and give the skin a more reddish hue in this area. Male characters will have more of a desaturated bluish tint around the chin and the jawline, mainly due to things like your 5 o'clock shadow. Now, this is, of course, much less pronounced on females, but it's still something to consider. Also, the blood vessels around the lips and in this area are a lot more deoxygenated, so the lips might have more of a violet purplish hue than a brighter red hue that the cheeks have. While I'm painting the base color of the skin, I'll often go to my viewport shading options by clicking the arrow next to my viewport shaders, and I'll switch it from combined to diffuse color. This way I'm only seeing the base color information that I'm painting, without any speculars or other lighting information. While painting in the diffuse color view, I'll often use the color picker icon to pick a color directly from the surface of my model and continue to blend it with the other color zones. From here, I'll continue to refine blending the color areas together. I'll often switch between the combined render view pass and the diffuse color one. I'll also eventually go to my shader and I'll increase the roughness to max. This way I'm not looking at any other specular information. While I'm trying to keep everything that I'm painting in the base color logically consistent, like I said with the color zones earlier, skin has a lot of randomness, so it's okay to be a bit messy. Since I opted to create sculpted eyebrows on our character rather than creating a hair texture, I'm going to go ahead and paint in some eyebrows as well. I'm going to choose a desaturated bluish midtone to paint in the eyebrows. You can also switch the blending mode on your brush like you would in Photoshop or any other program. So once I've painted in the eyebrows, I'll also switch my brush to a blending mode of multiply and I'll paint in some darker areas. I can then switch it to screen and paint in some highlighted areas, just to give a little bit of randomness. After getting a first impression of this, I realized I made them pretty big and bushy. So I'm just going to switch to the diffuse color mode, and I'll color pick from the area around the eyebrows to just dial back some of the spillover. Also, this character still has those scars on the left side of his face, and those would create a gap through the left eyebrow. So I'm going to turn off the symmetry mode, and I'm going to add a little bit of a darker reddish color in the area of the scarring. I recommend turning off symmetry from time to time because it'll help to create a little bit more randomness and help make your skin look a little bit more convincing. As the hues and textures on your skin are not going to be perfectly symmetrical. So far, everything we've been painting in the base color has been relegated to one image texture. Now, this is a very destructive workflow, meaning that if we were to make any major changes to the base color, we would probably have to paint over and destroy the detail that we've already created. Now, there's nothing inherently wrong with working in this method, it's just that we have a certain disadvantage due to a lack of control. However, we can still use the shader editor to create layers of textures like we would have in a program such as Substance Painter or Quixel Mixer. Now, it would be practical to create a new layer to paint in details like the eyebrows or the darkness around the scar. But we've already done that. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new texture map, which we're going to use to paint in some shaving stubble around his chin and jawline. To start, I'm going to create a new image texture at 2048 by 2048, and I'm going to give it a completely white base color. This image texture is ultimately going to get multiplied on top of our current painted skin. Next, I'm going to go to the texture tab, and I'm going to create a new texture and play around for a little while until I find something that I think would be appropriate to create a stubble-like texture pattern. Ultimately, I'll settle with a Stucky pattern, which I'll set the noise basis to Voronoi F3, pattern to plastic, and type to soft. I'll also drastically decrease the size. I'll also hit the checkbox next to color ramp, and I'll invert the white and black value. With the standard brush, I'm going to set my color to a dark desaturated blue. I'll then set our texture to the texture mask input, and then I can proceed to brush in the stubble pattern across the jawline, chin, and upper lip. You can also play with the color ramp in the texture properties to decrease or increase the contrast of the pattern. I'll also use the same pattern later on across the character's scalp to create a shaved head texture. Since this whole stubble pattern is relegated to a separate image texture, if we're unhappy with it, we can just remove the image texture. Once we've finished creating all our image textures and base color nodes, then we can export the completed base color map using the orthographic camera and plane setup that we created earlier in the video. Once I'm happy with the stubble pattern, I'll go back to our original skin color texture layer and continue to do some refinements. Now I'm going to remove the texture that we created from the texture mask input, but feel free to play around with textures to give your brush patterns more randomness. This can really help improve the quality of your skin texture painting. Remember that you are not only relegated to the simple procedural textures that are available in Blender. There is a large variety of different alphas and image textures that you can download from across the web that are appropriate for different texturing tasks. Once I'm fairly happy with my progress on the base color texture, I'll show you a few other ways that we can add some detail using the curvature map we generated earlier. All right, so I'm going to create a few more mix RGB nodes and I'm going to set them to multiply. I'll be plugging the curvature map into the factor input and our base color into the first color input. I'll set the second color to be somewhat of a highly saturated midtone, And then I'll insert a color ramp between the curvature that's plugged into the factor input and the MixRGB node. This will be used to control the intensity and the spread of the curvature map's effect. When I'm done with this process, I'm pretty happy with how the base color map has turned out. Next, we're going to work on creating a roughness map, and we'll be using much of the same method. But first, I'll do a little bit more organization by adding some frames and labels to my different node groups. This is just for clarity on my material shader graph. I'll create a few frames, and I'll give them their own colors. I'm going to frame the area of nodes that process my normal map, the base color, and the curvature map. I'll also frame the nodes that I create later on that are controlling the roughness. To create our roughness map, we'll be using our curvature, base color, and a few other procedural textures. I'll also create another image texture, which we'll be using for some manually painted roughness detail. I'm going to take the skin texture that we painted, and I'm going to plug it into an RGB to black and white node. I'll then plug this node into a color ramps, which will help me control the values. I'll create some more MixRGB nodes, and we'll plug the curvature map into the factor input like we did before, once again using a color ramp to control the intensity and spread of the effect. I'll be mixing our black and white map with a noise texture to help give our roughness map some more randomness and variation. I'll play around with some more MixRGB nodes, set to different blending modes such as Multiply Screen and Overlay. And I'll use the new image texture that I created to paint in some manual roughness details. Another texture map that we can create that's optional but can give some added realism 
is a subsurface scattering texture. This will be a black and white texture with just a little bit of brightness painted around the areas of the ears and maybe a little bit around the nose and brow. These are areas where light would pass through the surface and shine through on the other side. Once this is completed, we can work on exporting the texture maps from our completed material. All we have to do is control shift and click the final node processing each of our material outputs. We then just capture a snapshot of it using our orthographic camera and image plane setup. And then we can export out an image texture for use in another game engine environment. You can even use a combined RGB node to make a ambient occlusion roughness and metal map texture for use in Unreal Engine. This texture would have each of your material outputs set to a separate RGB channel. I'm using a downloaded image texture for the eyes in this instance that I downloaded from the ArtStation Marketplace, but you can find tutorials on how to create them procedurally in Blender as well. So I hope you found some part of this video useful. If you did, please consider subscribing and hitting the bell icon to receive a notification whenever I post a new video. So until the next one, good luck getting those projects done, and I'll see you in the next video.